Hey, welcome back to another episode of From the Vault. On this episode, I'm going to feature Dragon Magazine issue number 66. Now, this is a very special place in my heart, and there's a reason why. I did not originally own this as part of my collection. I got it many years later, I want to say in the late 90s, uh, from a comic book store. I found it in the back issue section. And the reason why this is so special is because this magazine contains a dictionary of thieves can't. So let's rewind the clock. Issue number 66 was published in October of 1982. My friend Carter Denton had this magazine. He had a subscription and he had this magazine. And when he showed us that there was a pocket thieves can't dictionary, it was like game changing. So all of a sudden we were able to add this little sprinkling of thieves can't vocabulary to our plane. Um, Carter, for example, wanted to name his character Shadow Thief, so he looked up the, the um, translation in the Thieves Can't Dictionary, and it came out to be Eski Basim, who ended up being a hugely famous character of his. Um, but more than that, we were able to use it, you know, on the DM side, we were able to use this sprinkling of Thieves Can't in props, in written scrawled messages and notes that the characters would find, and, and it became such a huge thing. So we'll explore that in a little more depth, but I want to start off with the cover here. Um, and this is a cover done by Paul Sanju, uh, and he's not an artist that I'm familiar with, but I really like the cover. Um, what we have here is apparently an adventuring party who stumbled across the underground lair of some lizard people, maybe. I'm not really sure exactly what kind of Saurian race they are. But um, looks like some, some lizard people are checking out a glowing treasure chest. And there's maybe a fighter and a rogue and a wizard who are kind of peering over that, that um, boulder to, to kind of see what's going on. Um, it took me a minute to figure out where the artist signed this piece. He actually included it right down there on, on the actual treasure chest, which is, I think, kind of a creative way to, to sign a piece. So anyway, it's a great cover. Um, let's go ahead and explore this, this issue. So your typical Dragon Magazine content from years of old, letters to the editor. Um, and it's a fair amount of nerdy, crunchy stuff where they're arguing minor details that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter. So I'll skip that. And I want to go to the first big article. Um, and this is kind of new in this format. As far as I could tell, they basically had two writers uh, take pro and con positions on the topic of whether or not spellcasters should be able to use weapons that are prohibited by their class. Um, and this is something I remember from the old days having discussions about. Uh, and they reference this in these articles. You know, things like, why was Gandalf, who is a wizard, able to use a sword, for example? Or, you know, other examples from fantasy fiction where spell users used weapons that in D&D, at least in first edition D&D, they weren't allowed to use. So on the yes column of whether or not they should be able to use prohibited weapons, um, we have John Sapienza, who is the writer. Uh, he argues that spell users should be able to use forbidden weapons, but with decreased damage. Uh, on the no side, we have an uh, article uh, written by Bruce Humphrey, who argues that rule restrictions on weapon usage are firm and fair. So I read through these, and I kind of came across some interesting thoughts and and just to summarize i could see if you know if you wanted to implement more open possibilities for weapon choices for spellcasters you could adopt something like what john sapienza wrote and just modify the damage for those weapons um and you you could argue that in story it makes sense because spellcasters spent more time training on magic and not on uh, weapon use and weapon proficiency, so their ability to cause damage with those weapons would be decreased. Um, you could make that point. Um, and at the same time, I'm reading this article with Bruce Humphrey about rule restrictions and why they exist and why they're fair. And I see kind of more the mechanic side of it where 
there's a reason for game balance. You know, if, if wizards and clerics and druids could use any weapons that they wanted, um, doesn't that in a, in a way take away something from the fighting based classes? So anyway, it's, it was a fascinating kind of back and forth um, in arguments. And the, the Sapienza articles continued and in that continuation, I'm going to open up the page so you could see on the right side there, hopefully you could see, he provides weapon damage table stuff um, by weapon category, and he shows how fighters, semi-fighters, and non-fighters do different damages with those weapons. Now, I don't remember ever implementing this system when we played first edition AD&D, but I, I think had we been more aware of this as an option, we might have implemented it because I think it, it could work, you know, and, if, and, and here's the thing, the biggest thing above all, rules are there for a reason and mechanics are there to make the game work. Um, and I don't think that players should just be able to like rape the game. They shouldn't be able to like bend the rules so far that they create some ludicrous or preposterous imbalance in the game. But if someone has a really strong character concept and a really strong reason included in their background history or included somehow in the fabric or the essence of who their character is, and, and as a DM, if you decide to let them do that, not so that they could break the game, but just to, to help them enjoy their experience of playing the game more, then I say go ahead. You know, I mean, we, we as, as DMs, our, our purpose there is to facilitate a game that's fun. Challenging, yes. Deadly, sure. But ultimately, we're playing a game to have fun. Everybody plays the game to escape, and it's, it's about having fun. So, you know, if, if someone could make a cogent argument why their human wizard would need to have a battle axe and why he would be skilled in that battle axe, and it didn't necessarily break your game, then I say, why not? And maybe this, this uh, alternative weapon system, damage system that John Sapienza proposed, could have been something that you could have implemented. And for all you old school role playing fans, people who are still playing first edition AD&D, I'd be curious if you have any, any input on that. So if you do, leave some comments below. Moving on. Here we have another convention schedule. I like to reference these to give you an idea. So we have RockCon, which apparently was in Rockton, Illinois. Acrominicon, oh, like Akron, okay, cool. So that's Ohio. Fall Sci-Fi Convention, which looks like it was in California. World Fantasy Convention, which was in Hartford, Connecticut. StarCon in Vancouver, British Columbia. Wargamers Weekend in Salisbury, Massachusetts, and Autumn Revel. Oh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. There you go. The staff of TSRR Hobbies will get together with gamers for another of TSR's mini conventions at the American Legion Hall. Could you imagine that? Just going to an American Legion Hall and like hanging out with Arneson and Gygax and Tim Cask. Like, that would just be crazy. Um, but anyway, they had, they had conventions scheduled back in 1982, and I'm certain that they were nowhere near the size of most of the big conventions now, but um, fun times. So on the opposite side of that page is a full page advertisement by Ral Partha. So those of you who are fans of old minis, you know that the big names like Ral Partha, like Grenadier, like, oh my God, I'm forgetting because I'm old. So. But you know there are a few of the big companies who made minis, and and um, Ralph Partha had a whole collection here. And on the bottom of that sheet, it said special limited release, the Imperial Dragon. So you might remember in um, issue number eighty-two, they had a full-page ad for that uh, fifty-dollar miniature, which I'm sure was epic. So again, you know, if any of you are owners of that epic classic limited edition mini. Leave a comment below. I'd love to see a picture of it, what it looks like now. All right, moving on. ElfQuest. Okay, so I was never a big fan of ElfQuest. Like, I was aware that it existed. I had comic book nerd friends who were really into it, and I might have, like, thumbed through a few. 
but I don't think I ever really got into it big time. But here's an example, again, like in issues 61 and 62, where Dragon Magazine contributors took ideas from existing fiction um, and other worlds and gave you the stats or build for how to use it in AD&D, which is kind of cool, because if ElfQuest was your jam, this would have been gold, you know? So they would have given you stats and, and all the information and background and character information about each of these NPCs, or if you wanted to, I guess, use them as characters. But uh, we have Cutter, who's a fourth level elf fighter, Skywise, who's a third level elf fighter, fourth level thief, Lita, who is a seventh level cleric, um, Rayek, who is a fourth level elf fighter, and Picknose, who is a fourth level dwarf fighter. I don't know why they have him in quotes. Maybe dwarves didn't really exist, so he was just kind of a special anomaly. And then they have a little bit about elves, um, talking about elves in the elf quest universe. So kind of cool, kind of neat. Oh, so this ad right here on the right side of the page, Steve Jackson's Illuminati. So this is a game that a lot of people back in the day played. Um, I never played it, I wish I had. Kind of thinking about old school role playing games, that's one where I wish I could find a group to play Illuminati. Um, I got the impression that it was just a really fun game, um, you know, kind of mystery but fun almost bordering on ridiculous. I did play Paranoia one time, and that was fun. Um, it, was, it was one of the most competitive gaming sessions that I ever had. So if Illuminati is anything like Paranoia, um, that's cool. But anyway, we're moving on to Sage Advice. So here's, here's that kind of unearthed arcana element, you know, where Dragon Magazine's giving us a look into you know, behind the scenes into what they're working on or how they think about stuff, right? So people write in questions and they kind of respond. Um, Sage Advice is around now. I follow the Twitter channel for Sage Advice. It's interesting. But, you know, here it is, 1982, and they were doing this in magazine form. So, are demi-humans able to manufacture magical items? The answer is yes, of a wide variety of types, though not as many as humans are able to make because of the demi-humans' limited ability to climb in class levels. Yeah, so that's, that's a prime example of crunchy first edition rules, like why would some other race not be able to climb as high in levels as humans? Uh, it's so counterintuitive to me. I mean, elves live for thousands of years and they can't get higher level than humans? Makes no sense at all. All right, so anyway, um, there's another question. How does one make or acquire Elfin chainmail? And this is back in a time when they said Elfin, E-L-F-I-N, which bothers the crap out of me. It's Elvin. The language is Elvish. Elfin makes no sense to me, but anyway. Um, so then they go on to talk about that. The next one are, is, why are elves unable to become rangers? Why do half-elves have limited ranger abilities? Shouldn't sylvan elves have ranger-like talents? How are certain of the elven deities able to have ranger fighting abilities if their subjects do not? These questions are all interrelated to some degree and are some of the most asked questions about elves in general. The answer to all of them lies in the nature of the ranger class. So they're going to pawn it off on the class, but again, that's just stupid. Like, elves, Legolas, uh, any, any elves, any race should be able to be any class. But this is that kind of era in D&D &D where I think in an effort to create game balance, they had so many limitations on things. Um, you know, which is probably why I never, I literally never played a monk in first edition AD&D. And if you're old and you know first edition AD&D, you probably understand why. Um, just, yeah, you know. so. Um, here's another ad, Siege Equipment from Ramf Miniatures. Never heard of them, but it looks cool, kind of, kind of the dipping into the terrain thing. On the bottom right page, another Aftermath ad. Again, I, I saw those in almost every issue of Dragon Magazine, and I eventually bought the game. And someday on From the Vault, I'm going to bring all that old crap in and show you just how crunchy that game was. But it did have a lot of good art and a lot of interesting mechanics. All right, Featured Creatures, Official AD&D Monsters for Your Campaign by Gary Gygax. So here's another thing, right? 
And some of these are going to be familiar because they're later published in hardcover form. So it looks like what Gary's giving us now are the Genie and Afridi, right? So he breaks them up, the Jan, the Dao, the Merid, all of which I think are still around. Uh, in fact, side note, in uh, the current Gaming Weekend campaign that I'm playing in, we just fought a Dao. It was in a temple in Curse of Strahd. I don't know if it's actually part of Curse of Strahd or our DM just like added this in, but we fought a Dao and we killed it. So there. Do, 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 do. Then we have From the Sorcerer's Scroll by Gary Gygax. Now, you may remember that we talked cantrips in one of the previous episodes of From the Vault. Here, Gary's dipping us into spells, not just cantrips, full-blown spells for illusionists, which is pretty cool. So we have chromatic orb, we have phantom armor, read illusionist magic, alter self, fascinate, ultra vision, ultra vision, whispering wind, delude, phantom steed, phantom wind, Wraith Form, Dispel Magic, Rainbow Pattern, Solid Fog, Vacancy, Advanced Illusion, Dream, Magic Mirror. Man, he's just pumping out those spells. Tempest, Fugit, Death Fog, Mirror Image, Phantasmagoria, Mislead, Shadow Walk, Weird. Weird's literally the name of the spell. I got to read that. Okay, level seven spell. When this spell is cast, the illusionist must be able to converse with the subject or subjects to bring this dweamer into being. During the casting, the illusionist must call out to the subject or subjects, informing one or all that their final fate, indeed their doom, now is upon them. The force of the magic is such that even if the subject or subjects makes their saving throw, fear will paralyze them for a full seven segments, and they will lose from one to four strength points from this fear although the lost strength will return in seven rounds. Failure to save versus magic will cause the subject or subjects to face their nemesis, the opponent's most feared and inimical, inimical to them. Actual combat must then take place, for no magical means of escape will be possible. The foe fought is real for all intents and purposes. If the subject or subjects lose, then death occurs. If the weird caused by the Dweamer is slain, then the subject or subjects emerge with no damage, no loss of items seemingly used in the combat, and no loss of spells likewise seemingly expended. Although each round of combat seems normal, it takes but one segment of real time. During the course of the spell, the illusionist must con concentrate fully upon main maintaining it. Wow, okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, on the far right side of this, this panel is a note about weapon specialization. So you may remember in second edition AD&D that specializing in weapons became a thing. And if you were a fighter and you didn't work your way up to specializing, you were a fool because it was the greatest thing ever. So here's uh, Gary's notes on this. In the course of a recent, recent visit from Len Lakofka, Wherein we were principally discussing cleric and druid spells, the subject of Len's unofficial archer subclass came up. I concurred with Len's position that a bowman, shaft readied, target at point blank range, was formidable. I agreed that the game as it is now, as, as it now stands, does not reflect such threat. We then discussed how to mesh the concept with the AD&D game system, and weapon specialization arose as the answer. We discussed use of any form of bow by a fighter or ranger. Certain conclusions were arrived at. However, after reflecting on the matter for some time, it became obvious to me that we did not go far enough in one case, and we went too far in another. Fighters have too long been the last choice class, the group who posed the least threat. This does not apply to Paladins, Rangers, or the new Barbarian subclass either. These all have abilities and powers far beyond the mundane world of a fighter. Therefore, weapon specialization applies only to fighters, excluding all subclasses. Fighters have the option to select one and only one weapon to become associated with ever afterwards. This option is known as weapon specialization. All right, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you get the gist. That's the birth of weapon specialization. I think it's pretty rad. Um, it was important because it made fighters like 
it buffed them, basically. It gave them that, that special zing that allowed a fighter, and you didn't have to specialize by any stretch, but if you did, it gave you some benefits. And then he talks about the effects of weapon specialization. So, moving on to other things. There's an article by Tom Armstrong called, Is It Really Real? Be careful with phantasmal force. Illusions can kill if used with skill, but fake healing is only a feeling. So this article is kind of interesting. It, it posits a couple ideas um, about the ability of phantasmal force or really any kind of illusion spell to inflict damage. And it counter argues the idea that if an illusion spell can inflict damage, then couldn't you also heal someone? If their mind believes they're being, being healed, won't their body then react accordingly? So it's kind of an interesting discussion. I'm not going to read it all, but uh, it was worth reading. Um, there's another sub-article to this related. It's a lot of illusionist content in this last six months of Dragon Magazine. Familiarity factor prevents illusionists from stealing the show. So it just kind of goes on to talk about disbelieving, making saves, that kind of stuff, um, which makes sense because if you didn't have that option, illusionists would be hella powerful and probably very unbalanced as a class. Do, 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 do. Up next, the central reason why I bought this. Thieves can't. So this is um, a primer for the language of larceny. So this work is made possible through the efforts of several linguists, many of whom have lost their lives in their attempts to learn as much as they could about Thieves' Cant. Although this primer and the accompanying translation dictionary are admittedly incomplete, this is believed to be the most extensive compilation to date of the language. They go into pronunciation and writing. They go on to talk about nouns, modifiers, numbers, pronouns, word order. I mean, this is, this is 1982, man. They didn't have like an elf to English dictionary, elvish to English dictionary. They didn't have a dwarvish translation article. Um, so this is pretty epic. I mean, just, just the first two pages talk about the language and the structure and how it all works. Verbs and tenses, modal auxiliaries, the verb, negative constructions, prepositions, word formation. And then it's literally a pocket dictionary. They talk about how to assemble it. So basically, you would take the staples out of this, right, very carefully, which my friend Carter did out of his magazine. There's the staples. You take the staples out, uh, open them up, you pull these sheets out, and then you'd fold it, fold it, and then you'd have this little pocket dictionary. And it was awesome. I mean, you could flip through it, and we made photocopies of it, which probably is not even remotely legal, but, you know, whatever, games. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What should I look up in this? I know what I'll look up. Vault. I wonder if Vault would be in here. It should be, because this is a thieves thing. So, and they might rob vaults. It's hard to read upside down and backwards. Where the hell is the V? There we go. T, U, oh my god, where is the V? There's no V. All right, maybe there is a V and I'm an idiot. I don't know. But anyway, oh, here, warrior, Kau, Kauau, K-A-U-A-L, Kauau. Winter is Baisalik, which is Manka. All right, so anyway, it's pretty cool. Thieves can't pocket dictionary, English to can't. A lot of good times, a lot of good times. So I wonder if anybody has a digital version of that. I mean, it would have, it, it's not, it can't be rocket science to type all that stuff into a Google sheet, you know, of some kind or whatever. Um, but I think it'd be a neat thing to add into the game, you know? And maybe it'd be cool where some of the vocabulary is available to like low level uh, rogues. And as they gain levels, they get like more of the vocabulary disseminated to them. And then they can use that in turn when they're communicating with other thieves and rogues and guilds and. I don't know, whatever. There's so many options for how to use that kind of stuff. 
Then there's an article talking about language rules. So language rules leave lots of room for creativity in your campaign. I couldn't agree more. In fact, if you look at my channel, I have a whole thing about languages. Um, I made a video about languages and how adding in sprinkling of languages can really ramp up the immersive element in your game. So this actually goes deep though. Um, they provide like a timeline for the languages and how they formed. It might be hard to see on the shot, but on the bottom of the page, they start off with like old elfin, which is fairy, which um, almost like a, a family tree. Like it goes down to drow and middle elfin. And then, you know, the drow languages go to Nolish, kobold, old goblin, strong giant influence of ogreish and trollish. The middle elfin breaks up into all these other languages. So it's kind of an interesting language tree tracking how all those languages came about. Um, so yeah, that's a multi-page article, kind of neat. Fantasy philology, playing the fluency percentages. So this is, if you wanted to go really crunchy, um, you could add in the degrees to which your character is fluent in a language. So it wouldn't just be like, I speak Elvish. It would actually be percentages of fluency that would help you, and there would be cross- Fluency. So maybe if you spoke Elvish, you'd also be able to speak these sister languages, like with the Merfolk or whatever. Um, so it kind of it kind of goes even deeper into the mechanics of how to make language more interesting. I don't know if you need all the crunchy rules for it. You could just kind of say that, like in my homebrew, I have my characters organically learn languages and I give them the vocabulary and I kind of, as they learn it and they actually do that in character and in game, I, I drop more morsels of information and vocabulary and I allow them to translate more and more stuff if they come across stuff. So I like it just being organic without having percentages and rules and tables to look up. Um, but you know, everybody's got their own thing. So that article was interesting nonetheless. And then there's another article about language. Old Dwarvish is still new to scholars of language lore. And this is cool because uh, this is by Clyde Heaton. Um, he starts breaking down, not in, in the same depth as Thieves Can't, but he starts breaking down Old Dwarvish. So he has um, past tense, present tense, future tense examples, um, and he has, you know, some 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 of the vocabulary. This isn't like a full dictionary like the Thieves' Cant thing was, but he's got some some vocabulary here. Um, and also word order. This is an interesting one that's kind of funny. So he gives an example of word order. The sentence, the fat dwarvish woodcutter cut down my big oak tree with an axe, would be reorganized and translated as follows. Dwarf, fat cutter, wood my tree oak big, did cut down axe. And then he has the translation in Dwarvish, which I, there's no way I'm going to try to pronounce that. So anyway, um, that's pretty crunchy, but it's also kind of a cool thing. So if you were deep into it and you wanted to integrate that, that would be huge. Um, especially if you were running some epic campaign that was very dwarf-centered, or maybe your adventurers were, you know, had discovered this lost Dwarvish kingdom underground and they were trying to translate things having those little morsels you know scraps of old parchment that you've made for props or just you know saying the words as a as a one of the last dying dwarves says the words and they have to write down the words as they hear them but they spell it phonetically and then later they have to try to translate it i don't know you know there, there are a lot of options for how to integrate those kind of cool early creative ideas okay Next up in the book, we have New Monsters for Low Levels. So this is by Leonard Lakofka. So we have the Euparkaria, Euparkaria, Compsognathus, and a whole listing of miniature animals. Very interesting. Um, the first two look like lizards, and the second page is all about miniature animals. So I'm guessing that like it says ape, gorilla, there's a whole list of them over here. Baboon, badger, bears, boars, buffaloes, bulls. I, I've never really thought of a miniature bull or a miniature elephant, but that's cool. Um, they were created via spells, similar to those that were so successful in creating giant reptiles, insects and amphibians and the like. So it sounds like it, they were animals that at one time were normal and then have 
been miniaturized through magic. Then they just have looks like normal animals. Um, this is the kind of stuff you'd find in the fifth edition player's handbook now, but it's cool that these, uh, these guys thought that maybe people would want stats for normal animals because those could be included in encounters as well and not always for combat. So um, vultures, carnivorous flying squirrels, hawks, falcons, animal skeletons. Um, that's my thought on that. Dragon Publishing 1982 Module Design Competition. So imagine before there was a DMs Guild on the webs that they actually had competitions for people to send in modules and the winning module would get published by TSR. That would have been like a dream come true, right? If you, you know, if you were an eager and talented writer and DM and you had great ideas, you could put all this stuff together and send it in and they would publish it. And I didn't read all the general rules, but I'm pretty sure that they would own the rights to your intellectual property. But, you know, I mean, for some people that doesn't matter. Just the bragging rights to be like, I'm a published module writer would be pretty huge. Um, oh, Citadel. Remember when I was talking about miniatures earlier? Yeah. Grenadier, Ralpartha, Citadel. Citadel, there's an ad for Citadel right there. They had a whole bunch of minis. And they were not cheap, but you know, the minis were not made of plastic back then either. So then we get towards the end, our usual book reviews. So we've got Off the Shelf, looks like uh, The Coming of the Horse Clans by Robert Adams, The Iron Dream by Norman Spinrad, and Mall World by Samtau Sukaritkul. Never heard of those. The Earth Shaker by Lynn Carter. Anyway, a um, whole bunch more books being reviewed here. Then there's a short story called Friends in High Places. So I read this and it was funny and I laughed. It was really good actually. Um, good nerdy humor by Roger E. Moore. Um, Realms of Wonder, the 1983 Dungeons and Dragons fantasy art calendar. Oh, how I wish I had that. I wish they would make those again. I would buy one. I would totally buy one. Maybe they do make one. I don't know. Then we have comics at the end. What's new with Phil and Dixie? Never really got into that one. So let's turn the page and go to Wormy. So here's an issue of Wormy. And um, the big black cat with wings is Solo Mariah. Solo Mariah. And so Mariah is a sentient shadow cat of some kind with magical powers and wings. I vaguely remember that character um, from reading the Wormy comics. That has been another edition of From the Vault. Thanks for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And I have a whole boatload more of these. And they won't just be Dragon Magazines, too. I have a lot of old games and other gaming accessories and game-related stuff to dig up from my basement and share with you all. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Stick around. Thanks for subscribing. Watch my other videos about crafting and gaming vlogs and DM tips and all those kind of things.